This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Who's glad to be here? Hallelujah. Who is glad?
sometimes we feel like we don't know what to say, we don't know what to sing, and this is going to be an easy one. I know we're having issues with our words, and I apologize for that. This is going to be simple. There's only three parts to this, and I want you to sing it with all your heart, okay? Wonderful, beautiful, glorious, matchless in every way, wonderful, you have an opportunity to get them. If you don't have them here, just raise your hand and the usher will make sure that you get them. So we're going we're gonna to celebrate communion this morning. We're going to celebrate communion because communion is the remembrance of the bloodshed and has given his body for us to be forgiven. This isn't a ritual. This isn't something we just do to do. This is something we do to honor him and to glorify him. Because he's going to fill us. He fills us through the Holy Communion. We have an opportunity to get out of the old covenant and into the new covenant with Jesus. So as we're here this morning, we need to take the opportunity to just examine ourselves knowing that he has forgiven us as far as the east is from the west. No matter what we've done, no matter how broken we may have been or may be in the moment, when we approach him and we repent, we ask for forgiveness. It's done. It's over. Just like on the cross. And he lives within us. And 2 Timothy 2 says that even when we're unfaithful, he remains faithful because he can never deny himself. So if you just open the top and the, the bread is in the top, if you need help, just ask the usher. I got a double portion today. I get double forgiveness. We all get double forgiveness. Unlimited forgiveness. 
It doesn't matter how broken we feel. We are whole in Him. And He's not looking for perfection. He's looking for our hearts because when we give Him our hearts, He molds our hearts so that our desires become His desires for us and we live in perfect alignment with His will for our lives. So as we take this bread this morning, remember that it is He and He only who can forgive us and absolve us of our sins. So let's take this bread together. over and this is the blood when we drink this we're, we're, this is his blood we're honoring the blood that was shed he knew that we were going to sin again and again yet he still went to the cross for us so that we can live in perfect alignment with him and the worship team sang so beautifully about laying it at his feet just lay it at his feet this morning give it to him he desires to have it so he can make us whole in him let's take this together father we just want to take this opportunity to thank you for your amazing grace in our lives father that your word never returns void father that your love for us is never ending and even when we depart from you, you do not depart from us, Father. Father, even when we fall short of the glory of you, your grace is ever bounding. So, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come to you again and again and again, seeking forgiveness, seeking for your perfect will to be the guiding light in our lives. So, Father, as we stand here before you this morning, we just want to give you the honor and the glory, Father for the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you could just pass your uh, cups to the end of the aisles to the other way. Well, good morning. Hey, welcome to Oasis today. It's good to see you guys here today. You having a good day? Oh, about two of you are. Well, I, I'm sure it's better than that, but I know you're finding your seat. I understand. Too many questions at one time, man. What a great time of worship, communion. It's kind of moving into what, uh, I, you know, just the opportunity just to be able to say, you know, I, may, I was able to come to church today. Amen. Amen. Some people can't do that today. Uh, be able to be connected. You know, the Bible says this is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. I say it all the time, but it's so true because we really can't take, shouldn't take for granted the day. Amen what we have, what God is doing in our life. But anyways, it's so good to see you all. Uh, those of you joining us online, thanks for being a part of our service today and connecting with us also. Um, of course, a couple of announcements we're going to give you. We uh, don't have FYI today, so me and, and Jimmy's going to be the FYI guys today, so we're going to just care a little bit things that are happening. But um, we want to take the opportunity, first off, before we do that, to prepare to give to God today. Now, many of you give online. Thank you so much for your continued support, but we also know a, a lot of people like to, like to give in, in person, which is totally good, you know, I, no, no worries about that. We're just grateful that you're supporting and you're in ministry, connecting with it, and so many great things. I know next week, um, well, I didn't do it today because I knew we were going to talk about the outreach that took place this weekend. Next week, we'll be able to share some pictures of uh, the, the barrels that were received in Haiti. The following week after that, we should have uh, some more of our things from Cuba and Indonesia, so we'll be able to show some of those things. Uh, just outreaches that you've been a part of and helped make happen, um, and we want to thank you. So whether your you're giving is, is helping to take care of the basic stuff or helping to connect on the other part of the world, other side of the world with other countries and, and establishing churches and helping them move forward and really carry out that mission, Thank you for running with us. Amen. Thank you for letting that be a part of what's happening. So, hey, for those of you that maybe you've already given this week or this month or however you normally give or support the ministry that's taking place, we're going to pray over that. If you're giving right now, we're going to pray over that. If you're giving online, uh, you can follow the instructions and be able to do that. But uh, we just believe that it's important that we honor God with our giving. And I was always a big thing that my parents always prayed over. What we gave, they prayed over it. It wasn't just, okay, fill the check out, fill this, and just throw it in there. But they actually prayed because they said, God, I'm dedicating this to you. And also the fact of thanking God for his blessings back into our life. We don't give, you're not giving to get something. But you know what? You're opening up your life and thanking God in advance for what he's already promised he'll do. Because there is the promises of God that talk about how that God blesses us back when we honor him. Amen? 
That doesn't mean you're going to have a Rolls Royce tomorrow. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is that we need God involved in every detail of our life. Okay, so let's just pray. Father, we thank you today. As we honor you in our giving, we just thank you, Father, for those that have given online, those that are giving right now, those that will be giving this week or this month. I just thank you, Father, for their connection with the ministry, what they're doing, for the work of Oasis, helping people know God, find hope, and make a difference. Father, whether that's locally in our community uh, and even as we reach in the uttermost parts of the world, as the Bible has commanded to do, here and abroad. And, Father, as we carry out that mission, I thank you, Lord, that, that as, as we give, as we connect with that, that your blessings are back upon each giver, that you are supplying, you're providing, you know those that need jobs. Father God, we stand in agreement for the jobs to come in. For those that, that need a promotion or need a change in their job, Father God, we know that you're concerned about even those details. Father, just the basic things in life, Father, we thank you that you are concerned with that, and we thank you in advance for your provision in the lives of each and every person is here today as they honor you, that you as your word has promised, and you are a promise keeper, not a promise breaker. And Father, that you do supply and provide back and meet the needs in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So while you're giving, the ushers are going through, uh, Jimmy's going to come over here. I just had two announcements I wanted to make about uh, the bulletin. We have the information within here. One is that the collective, uh, as our, our uh, 18 to 30 group age, they're meeting on Thursday, I mean, not Thursday, on Saturday night. Uh, that information is in here as far as other things. Um, also, the other thing is that next Sunday, do you know what next Sunday is? Spring ahead, time ahead. So that, I know that's, and we're like, oh yeah, one hour, no, wait, do we get, no, we lose an hour, right? Yeah, we lose an hour, so yeah. So, and, and it's always funny, we always, that's one of the challenging ones, is because when people come to church, you know, we always come an hour late, or an hour and 15 minutes later, 20 minutes late, whatever, because the time wasn't changed. So just to help you out, I know it's a Sunday, you're not thinking about that on Saturday, but just remember that the time does go ahead, we lose an hour, um, but also, but church is still going to be at 9 and 11, okay? And I know you can watch it online, but we'd love to have you in the house, amen? So hey, Jimmy, come over here, tell us a little bit about what took place this, this weekend. Good morning. Uh, yesterday, we, uh, the outreach ministry that we have here at Oasis, we went did a laundromat outreach. We did the laundromat right here on St. George and Linden. We did the Avenel uh, laundromat, and we did a laundromat in Rawway, right by the UPAC Center, which, by the way, we're having uh, Easter service on April 9th. At. Right. Um, which to, is crazy that that's a month away. Yeah, right. so it's the same place, yeah. Um, so we had an opportunity. There was probably about 15 of us. We split up into groups of four or five, depending on where we were going. We were able to give out over uh, $1,000 to people who needed help with their laundry to be done. Maybe they had to pay for laundry and couldn't buy food, so they were able to do both. Maybe they weren't able to buy their child a small little piece of candy. They were able to do that because we were able to bless them. Those blessings come from the giving from our church. And even those who were unable to come were uh, able to give soap. We bought big one-gallon, five-gallon bottles of soap that we were able to give to people um, we were able to bless some people, a few in particular things. And in Avenel, there was a gentleman that came in, and Nicole and James, who were on the team, they tried to give the guy money. He's like, I don't want your money. He went to his car, and he came back, and he gave them $40. <laughs> <laughs> another, another family gave us $20 in that particular um, facility. In, um, in Broadway, right by the UPAC, we were able to give out um, money and, and help people, bring stuff in. There was a couple young people in there. We tried to connect them to the uh, collective ministry that we have. So they talked about maybe coming to the collective ministry. Uh, the Bible says that, that when you do this for the least of these, you do this for me. Yeah. Right? Right. So anything that we do, we do for the glory of Jesus, not for the glory of Oasis Christian Center, yeah. but to glorify him and all that he's yeah. done for us. Amen. Here, right in Linden, now our community is very, very diverse. Yeah. There's a lot of Spanish speaking in our community. And in Linden, we encountered a few people who were not bilingual. They spoke Spanish. Fortunately, every team had Spanish speaking people on it. Yeah. So I want to employ those who speak yeah. Spanish to come join the outreach committee. If you speak Creole, there was a, a two members that spoke Creole. Um, Dolph with, was, uh, was with us. He was able to speak Creole. They said they were coming. They may be here this morning. If you are, I apologize. But they were, he was able to speak to them in their native tongue and tell them about our church and Jesus. And they promised to come here at some point. Um, we were able to help a, a, a woman. We paid her cab fare home. Uh, 
we were able to give him some money. I, I mean, the, the, I, I can't even explain the impact that yeah. happened yesterday. Because she had a bunch of, bunch of laundry with her. She had two a bunch of... big bins. If you know anything about Linda, they have big bins. She had eight bags of laundry. She was probably in her 70s. She probably was doing laundry for eight to 12 people. And we helped load the van for her. And I'm not, it's not about us. Please yeah. don't think I'm saying what a great job we did. I want you to know the power of Jesus and how important it is that we be his hands and feet. Right. Yeah. On the cross, he charged his disciples to do more than he did. So we must do more mm -hmm. than what he did. We have opportunity after opportunity. So, And the other thing is if you want to donate to outreach, we now have a drop down online. And you can put it right in the outreach. The more money, and I'm not asking for money, the more money you give, the more opportunities yeah. we have to pay, to pay into the community. Yeah. So that we want, to, we, want, we want our flag, not the Oasis flag, the flag of Jesus Christ yeah. to be in the heart Amen. of this area. <laughs> so that we can draw people to Christ, yeah. to build the kingdom, yeah. because he said he'll come back when every knee bows and every tongue confesses. Yeah. So we still got work to do. Yeah. Um, and just a quick one, uh, FMO and WOW registration for retreats will be up in the next week or so. So look out for them because they fill quick. Yeah. Thank you, guys. So, Jimmy, it's, it's, more, it's more than just, because some of them may say, well, why are, you washing, why are you paying for people to wash their clothes? It's not about washing their clothes. It's, it's, a, it's a, a venue. It's an avenue, an opportunity to be able to demonstrate the love of Jesus. And, you know, if you have a wash machine at home, uh, you know, I thank God I've, I've, you know, I've had times where our machines have broken. I took them to my mom's house. I took them to someone's house. But not everybody has somebody that they can go take it to someone's house to do that they know. And they're having to use a laundromat, which is totally fine, you know. And, you know, actually we have done bigger things like, you know, laundromats. But it's an opportunity The people, all, everybody's coming through there. The people of all walks of life are coming through there. And you have the opportunity to help people know God, find hope, and make a difference. And so that those things are not just about, well, what have well, we washing clothes for? Because I remember I've had that reaction a couple of times. People say, well, why are we doing that? You know, because... Over the years, I mean, the last, I think the second time that you've second done it, second time, and you've had so many different people, you guys, and uh, Angel and Ada, who leads our team, our outreach team there, and uh, who will talk, we'll be sharing next service about this. Um, they, and all of you guys that have been involved in it, have reached so many people in so many different ways and, and witnessed to people, prayed with people over and over, so many different opportunities, right? I mean, anything else you want to speak to that, and I'll, yeah, I'll jump yeah, in afterwards, but... Least. I tried to keep it short. So we I know, I know. So but you know what? I want people people to understand that we're not just paying for laundry. So don't bring your laundry here. We, we don't have any way to do it. This is an outreach. It's out, we, outreach is out there. We're doing it. So. We might get Sue to be able to help you. No. Yeah. Um, there was a gentleman who yeah. was driving around Linden. He was driving around the lot. He did not have laundry. He did not have anything with him. He was in his car, Spanish speaking, not bilingual, from Ecuador. And he pulled up and he said to Ada in Spanish, What's up with you people? <laughs> what are you doing? And Ada said, we're, we're trying to help people who are less fortunate. The, the gentleman has not been back to church since he left Ecuador some years ago. He can't find a church where he's comfortable at. Um, so they were able to minister to him, Raquel and, and Ada and then Angel. Um, he's been suicidal, homicidal. He's having issues in his marriage. Um, and they were able to minister for him, to him for about 45 minutes to an hour. We took his information down. We came back. Pastor Paul was here. So I had a conversation with Pastor Paul. Um, so Ingrid and Jonathan's circle is probably going to overflow. And Serena's circle is probably going to overflow. Because as of to the reach moment, out to him and help, yeah, we don't yeah, have yeah. Spanish-speaking service. But we can connect them with Spanish-speaking circles. Yeah. And we can introduce them to the love of Christ. And God will make a way in the near future where we'll have access mm -hmm. to Spanish-speaking people to have the word given to them from this body yeah. um, at somewhere down the line. God will make a way. Yeah. There's a need, he'll make a way. Yeah. So that's one gentleman, no laundry. He had no laundry. He just happened to be in Linden searching for something. Mm -hmm. And he was searching for Christ, and we know he was searching for Christ because he stopped the Christians in the parking lot. <laughs> he didn't stop the other people. So no, it's not about the laundry. Please don't minimize what it is. Yeah. Um, it, it's about us pouring in to the lost and those who are in the dark, and, and it wasn't only adults. We had I'm looking at Shen Z. We had Shen Z, who's 20, Jaylene, who's 18, who were right up in there speaking Spanish. And, uh, I, I apologize, Pastor, but now he's starting. Shen, Shen Z in Norway sat with a family. If I go outside. long, it's his fault. Yeah, it's so. my fault. It's all right. You guys, second service could be mad at me. Shen Z sat with a family, 
right? It's a young lady who's involved in our takeover ministry, came to our church a handful of years ago, who's on fire for Christ. She sat with her family and Googled information for doctors because they couldn't find a doctor. Wow. But that's what I, we're talking mm -hmm. about. We're not talking about paying for laundry and folding clothes. We're talking about changing hearts and conditions yeah. and mm -hmm. being the hands, of Friday, uh, hands and feet of Jesus. So, you know, all glory goes to the King of Kings. Yeah. Prayers go up, blessings come down. Good stuff. Thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. I love that. We're ma you, you're making a difference. We're making a difference as a church. You know, if you wonder what's a, what Oasis is about, it, it definitely, you know, we're on a mission to live out our mission statement, to help people know God, find hope, and to make a difference. And hopefully, and it's not just here, but hopefully it's impacting your life so that where you go, you're, you are the body of Christ. Amen? The, body, a church, the church is not the building. Okay? Uh, it is an opportunity to reach beyond that and be able to make a difference in people's lives. So, anyways, hey, we're going to dive right in this morning. You know, we just, we just wrapped up a, a, a series. Hopefully you enjoy it. The Promise Keeper talking about the covenants of God and just bringing it from, from Adam and Eve all the way to Jesus and, 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 and the, the new covenant. And that one thing, the overarching thing from that is the fact that, you know, God is a, a promise keeper, not a promise breaker. He is about keeping his promises. In the scripture, uh, the Bible is full of promises, over and over. There are promises that to you and I, and you, you, there's, there's things that you go from and read so many different things that God has done. There's a, there's a little book that I know um, that you know, we've used, and there's one we hand out to new believers, but um, there's a couple of my different names, but they, they have like the, all the promises, not all of them, but the, the majority of the promises of God. There's one that we used to do is, um, oh, I forgot the name of it. Yeah, great if I remember the name of it before we, I opened my mouth talking about it. But, but it just went through and it talked about all those. And so there's a lot more companies that have made them like that. But it talks about every need and every situation and circumstance and kind of categorizes promises that deal with, you know, financial challenges or sickness or disease or, or this situation or, or frustration and discouragement and, and anxiety that give scriptures based upon what, it, it pulling up what God's word says. This is what his word says about those things. And sometimes we don't think about the fact, we talked about the promises of God and we took those six weeks and looked at and broke that down and talked about just seeing a pattern of God's provision and how it applies to our life. And so what I wanted to do was today and, and most likely next week is just take it a little bit further, not in the same kind of series talking about, talking about how do we walk some of those promises out in our life. And now it'd be impossible to go through every single promise that God's made. We'd be here for another year, probably two years doing that. But just want to give us some of the, there's a few that I had on my heart that I wanted to just connect you with that we deal with, some things that we deal with. How can we have that, what God's word says in there? How, what are some simple ways that we can plug that into our life? So let's just dive right in it this morning. I want to talk about God's, the promise of God's peace in our life. His peace and how his peace is strengthened in our life, how his peace is, is promised for our life. And so I want to start with a story. It's in the Old Testament, 2 Kings. It's about this, this promise. It ties in with this promise of peace. Uh, see it in motion. And um, I just want to kind of lay this story out a little bit. You know, as I said, it's from uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 4. And it, it involves the prophet Elisha. Not Elijah, but Elisha, who came after Elijah. Um, he, had, he would frequently travel through this village of Shum. And... As you pass through there, there's this wealthy couple that he, he would run into, or whatever the case may be. Maybe he talked to him. We don't really know all the details. But, uh, and they would invite him into their home to be able to come in for, for a meal. And so this was every time he would travel back and forth. He'd come through this little village. That couple was there, and they'd invite him in for another meal. Well, after a time, uh, you know, he would always just, just stop just to, to greet them. Well, this is what the Bible talks about. He would stop and greet them, and they would have a meal together. And so what, one day the lady decides, hey, you know, listen, he's, you know, tell her husband, she goes, you know, he's always coming through here. We want to do something, you know, good for, for Elisha, this prophet. And, and so they said, let's build a little room on, I think it was on the roof. They built it. And in that, and so the Bible says they put a little chair, a table, and a lamp. Lamp, and he would come in and he would stay there. Whenever he'd pass by, he'd stop and stay there with him for a day or two or whatever the case may be. And one day he, he's visiting and coming by and he, he asked his assistant, Gehazi, who was with him, um, what could they do for her? I mean, she, she and her husband had done all these things for them that were so kind, the generous, had fed them on their journey, had provided a way for Elisha to be able to stay uh, there. And she said, well, you know, what? You know, he says, what can we do for, what do you think we could do for, for this, this couple, for this lady and, and her husband? And so he, Hazy says this, she's elderly, and she and her husband are childless. 
And so Elijah, he says, okay, you know what? Go get her. Bring her, bring her up here by the room. So she comes up to the room that they had built, and she's standing in the doorway. And in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 16, it says, About this time next year, Elijah said, you will hold a son in your arms. I mean, that's, now, but at the same time, you know, she's, she's elderly, time has passed. She, you know, and especially more so than today, I'm not minimizing the fact of, but anyone that wants to have a child and is struggling with, 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 that, with that issue and trying to, that, that to happen, but especially going back in the culture of the day back then, not having a child was, was a big deal. It, it was a reflection on the woman when it may, not even be, it may not even be her problem, it could be the guy's problem, but ultimately she was the one that it was reflected upon because she was the one that couldn't have the baby. As I said, even though it takes two, and it doesn't have to always be, it's not always the, the, the female or the woman that may have the problem, but the man can have the issue himself, and that's why the child is not there, or not a boy, or all kind of things like that through history. People misunderstood how that would happen. So she, it's a sensitive point for her, because I'm sure they've hoped for this. They've prayed for this over and over and over again so many times. And, and here, I'm sure there's a joy inside of her, but you can also see the disappointment that she's had over the years is really coming out because she says this. She goes, no, my Lord, she objected. Please, man of God, don't mislead your servant. You see, in other words, she said, I can't, I don't, you know, don't get my hopes up and then have them crushed that this doesn't really happen. And so uh, this was obviously a painful topic for her and she didn't want to be disappointed. And, but as exactly what happened, the next year, she and her husband had a son. And so one day when the child was older, he, you know, he was out with his father. His father was out. They were like reaping harvest or something like that. And so the son was out with the father and he, he's saying, my head, my head. He was having a headache or something was wrong with his head. And so the scripture tells us that, so his father sent someone to go take him back home to his mother. And so the mom picks him up and she's got him in his arms and she's holding him. We don't know how old he is, but you know, obviously he wasn't a baby. He was an infant, whether he was like, I don't know. And who knows what it is, but at least he was walking, talking, he was involved, but they take him back to the mother. He gets up in his arms, and the mother's holding him, and his head is like hurting, and he dies in her arms. And so what she does at that point, she takes, the, she takes her son, this son of promise that God gave them that has now died. And I mean, sometimes in our life, there's things that we know that God has put in our life. We know there's things that God has directed in our life. There's words that, that we've stood upon. And what happens, we step out, everything seems great, then all of a sudden, something crashes and burns. And we're like, what happened here? I'm sure there's probably people here, we can relate to things like that. I don't understand. Why did that happen? And, why, and, and you know, the, what they say is that you don't know what you don't know. And I think that's a valid thing because there's a lot of things that happen in life that we deal with. We just don't know the bigger picture. I can't see everything of what's taking place. I can't see from here in the next 10 years what, what's taking in my life and what's happening in your life. But, in it, but so what does she do? She says, okay, you know what? She obviously grabbed a hold of the promise that, God, you gave me this child. It's not said there, but what we see is what happens is she picks him up. She play, goes in, and she takes him up to the room where they had built for Elijah. She lays him on Elijah's bed. Elijah is not there. He's off ministering somewhere else. She lays him on the be in bed in the guest room, and then she gathers her things, and she goes out hunting. Uh, you know, listen, ladies, when you're on a mission, look out. I'm not, that's not a derogatory thing. I, all of the women that have been in my life, my mom, my grandmother, you know, my wife, everybody, when you're on a mission, it's like, look out, because that mission's gone. This lady's on a mission. She's on a mission because she has wanted this. God's promised this child. She received this child, and this child has died, and she is after Elijah to find out what took place here. She told Elijah, don't, don't get me all up here and all excited about it and everything just crashed and burned. I can't, I, you know, you know the human aspect, she's got to be going through my mind. Why did this happen? Why did the prophet say, so I don't know if she's going to go chew him out. Maybe smack him up a little bit and then bring him back and see if he can raise his kid from the dead or whatever. But I'm sure she's not happy and I'm sure she's like determined and I'm sure she's like, you know, what's going to happen here? So who knows what all the emotions that are going on. But she literally goes and she hunts Elijah down. And so she does find him, and he's in the area of Mount Carmel. And so she approaches the camp where Elijah is at, and he, Elijah sees her coming. And so he sends out his, his assistants, hey, go out there, you know, meet her. And she, she's coming in and ask her these things. Are you all right? Is your husband all right? Is your child all right? Why is that? Because they're not expecting her. 
here comes this lady by her. I don't, I don't think she had somebody come with her, but, but the fact was, why is she here? She's never done this before. She's never just picked up and hunted him down, but she has at this point. So, so the prophet Elijah thinks, well, something's got to be up here. Okay, there's got to be a reason that something taking place. And so she, said to, uh, so she says to Gehazi, she goes, everything is all right. But we know that it wasn't. We know it wasn't. And so Gehazi led the woman to Elijah, and, and as soon as she sees Elijah, she, she falls down on the ground, and she grabs a hold of his feet. Eli, uh, Gehazi tries to, to pull her back, and, and Elijah says this in verse 27. He says, leave her alone. She is in bitter distress, but the Lord has hidden it from me and has not told me why. So Elijah at this point has no idea. He, he knows, he sees that there's something wrong with this lady. And obviously they were friends. He's friends with her and her husband. They travel like, many, many times. Uh, he's been in their home and, and, and they know him and, 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 and vice versa. And so here all this is going on. And he's like, he can see something is seriously wrong here with this lady. What's wrong with her? And so the woman said to Elijah in verse 28 and verse 30, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? In other words, I didn't ask you for a son. Why did you have to do this? Why did you have to make this promise? I get this child, and she doesn't say that he, we don't see that it's written that, it, that she tells him that the child has died, but obviously from the context of what's taken place, he understands what's happened. And she says, she says, didn't I tell you, did I ask you for a son, my Lord? Didn't I tell you not to raise my hopes? And immediately Elijah says to his assistant Gehazi, he says, I want you to take this staff of mine and I want you to run as fast as you can back to their home. And I want you, if someone stops to try to talk to you, ignore them, just keep going. And when you run in there, go into the room where the, where the child is and take this staff and lay it across his face. And that's all we see is that point. So the urgency of what's taking place. And, and so now the, the lady is still there and it says, but the, verse 30, the child's mom said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. Uh, so he got up and he followed her. She, so in other words, she says, listen, I'm going home, but you're coming with me is what she's saying. I'm not, I'm not just, I know he, I know Gehazi just ran out there, put that staff, I don't know what that staff's going to do. I need you flesh and blood. You are coming with me. I'm going to, if I have to, I, I, I don't know. Maybe she said, if you, if you don't come, I'm going to tie you up and drag you there. But I'm just kind of adding my own two cents in there. But she is determined. He, she says, I'm not leaving you. You, in other words, you are coming with me, whether you want to come with me or what. I don't care what you're doing, what you think. Let's go. You're coming with me. Okay. So the urgency of this, and obviously, and I don't blame her. So Elijah walks into the room where the boy was lying, and he prayed for him. He literally lays his body over him. And the scripture tells us that the boy's body soon, after a while, becomes warm. He begins to sneeze. He opens up his eyes, completely raised from the dead. And it's an incredible miracle that we see that takes place in scripture here. Now, you say, what in the world does this have to do with peace? When, when Elijah's assistant greeted the woman as he approached their camp, he asked specifically this, is everything all right with you, with your husband, with your son? And so she says, yes, everything is all right. Well, this conversation, it, in, it involves a Hebrew word. If you go back into the original Hebrew scripture, I'll read it in a second, but uh, the Hebrew word that is key to our message and what we're talking about, and that's God's peace. Um, and it's a, it's a word that's not so easily translated in English. English is very limited. Many of you that, that your native language is a different language outside of English um, from people that I know, in you know, my Spanish from this side to the other side, I, I, it was confusing a lot in the beginning because you know, it's like we have one English word for love, but you know, there's, in other languages, there's all kind of other words that talk about love. You know? So they talk about in Greek. In, in Greek, there's, like, there's friend love and erotic love. There's uh, friend, all these different kind of loves, and we just have love. I love hamburgers. I love my dog. I, I, I love my spouse. I, I love my mom. But hopefully you love your mom better than you love a hamburger, okay? Because we just don't have, we have that limitation in words, okay? And so many times when we read scripture, we're reading it, especially if you're reading it from an English standpoint, it may say one word, but that word has got a lot more depth in it. And, and it says a lot more than just that one singular word. And that's where taking and digging a little deeper 
and finding out, like, what is, what is the culture? What is taking place in the background of this story? You know, what is the, and that's why many times I'll go and I'll use other translations also. I'll, I'll pull out paraphrase translations like the Living Bible or the Message Translation or the Passion Translation uh, and the English Standard Version and the Living Bible, the New Living Bible, the Amplified Bible, all those different ones. And at times, if there's something I'm reading, I just feel that there's something more there. And you say, well, I don't have all those Bibles. If you have a phone, you can access that. You can just look it up and it's there. You can just search it and find out all those things. But, but if you do a little bit deeper, sometimes there's things that you need to dig a little deeper to find out, to really grab a hold of this. And so this is one of those things, this word. So this is, the, this is from the, the Oxford Jewish Bible, 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 24. It says this. It says, run now to meet her and say unto her, is it shalom with you? Is it shalom with thy ish, which is your husband? Is it shalom with your yalad, which is child? And she answered, shalom. Okay, well, that's where we need to find out, okay, what does the word shalom mean? Because it's easily translated as peace, but shalom means a whole lot more than just peace. It's a lot more than just a greeting and a farewell, which is also used for. In fact, when you look at shalom, shalom is more about the absence of conflict, so you figure they're asking this simple thing. Is it, is it shalom with you? Is it shalom with your husband? Is it shalom with your, 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 your child? And I'm not telling you you got to go out there and now start using the word shalom every time you're doing it because I know people will well, just say shalom to everything, shalom, shalom. You don't have to do that. I'm just simply saying as we look and read this that there's more that's being said than what we just look at and see. So what he's asking is, it, is, is, is it, are you in harmony? Are you, the, the word shalom means, and the bigger meaning is, as I said, is more the absence of conflict. It's about harmony and wholesome and completeness and prosperity, welfare, tranquility. In other words, everything that is good. And that's what he asks her. Is everything good? Is there an absence of conflict? Is, it, it was more than just a peaceful greeting. It was more than just something simple. See, it can describe the current cultural climate, a, a nation's relationship uh, with others, a, a church, a family, or your own personal life. It, for instance, we can be at peace with a country. In other words, not at war, but we're not at shalom with them. We're not in agreement with them. We're not, we're not in, in completeness. We're not in harmony with that country. We're not fighting, but we're definitely not in shalom. You understand? See, a, a marriage that's, that's going through some troubles and bumps and things like that, maybe not necessarily to a divorce court, but there can be no shalom in the home, even though we say, say it's all at peace. On the surface, yeah, it's good, but we know it's not all whole. Okay? In our personal lives, on the surface, everything can seem okay, but, but there's no peace. There's no shalom in our heart, in our soul, in our spirit. In other words, there's no harmony. There's no wholeness. There's no completeness. There's no, there's no prosperity or welfare and tranquility. Everything is not good. And so Gehazi approaches this woman and he says to her, is everything shalom with you? Shalom with your husband? Shalom with your son? And she answers, yes, everything is shalom, though you know, the fact is that when he is asking that, he's asking more than just a greeting or a farewell, which shalom is also used for the same thing. He's asking more the welfare of what's taking place. He's asking about her welfare. And why did she suddenly just appear here? Why did she just travel all this distance just to come to, to, to us, to meet us here? And, and she, but she says everything's fine when we clearly know that it wasn't. Her world was actually falling apart. She couldn't bring herself to say it. She, she did what we do many times. We, we, we say what we have to say just to get through the situation and move on to whatever is next. How many times do we say, hey, how's it going? And you get somebody that says, well, no, man, it's really going bad. And you're just like, oh, no, I didn't mean to ask all that. I just want, I just want to be nice to you and walk away. I, don't, I didn't want the story. I didn't want the details. I didn't want to know that you don't have any money. I didn't want to know that everything's broke. I didn't know that I want to hear about the fact that you're just on the verge of divorce. I didn't want to hear about any of that stuff. I just want to say, wanted you just to say, good, and go on your way. That's all I wanted. But now you're telling me your life history. I didn't ask for your life history. But sometimes we need somebody that we can sit down and give our story right now to. And the problem is that, unfortunately, a lot of people, and in, listen, I think we've all been guilty of that. Trust me. I think all of myself, all of us have been guilty that, it's, you know, you ask, hey, how's it going? And they say, oh, and you're just like, fog just comes over you. You're just like, oh, you're smiling, but you're not hearing a word they're saying. And it's sad that 
It's not that we get so busy in life that we can't take the time to meet somebody that's hurting, that someone's in pain. That we can so easily, as I said, I've been guilty of it too. I've, I've been the one on the side that just fogged over and I've also been the one that was hurting and someone asked me and I opened my mouth to say something and I saw the glaze over their eyes. I'm like, okay, Fred, just, just stop talking. Nothing against the person, it's just it wasn't what they were expecting or prepared to be able to hear. And so, and that's a whole other sermon. We're not going to dive into that. But I think, let me just interject this. There's, there needs to be a time that when we run across some people that are really hurting and they're in a moment of pain and situation and they had nobody to talk to and you just happened to ask the question. You're guilty. You asked. <laughs> you said, hey, how are you? And now they're responding that maybe we should take a moment to stop and say, but I, don't, I may not have all the answers. You don't always have to have all the answers. Sometimes somebody just needs somebody to listen to what you're going through. Or to be polite enough to say, you know what, I can't go into that right now. I would love to do this. Hey, when can we sit down and have this conversation in a time where there's not all this distraction around us and follow through with that? Amen? That's my sideline I'm just dropping in. That's a little, it's part of the story, but not really part of what I'm teaching on. But I think it's one of those things at time that because people, people are in pain. People are hurting. People are going through issues that we need. They, they need someone to talk to. And you know what? There's a lot of people that are not willing to stop and listen. And as Christians, part of it is, it's not about, well, I, I, I gave to help that. Here, here's some money. Some money can't fix a lot, of, a lot of problems. It can pay a bill, but it can't heal a heart. Okay? It can't give wisdom. It can't give hope. Yeah, it can pay a bill and a little bit of hope, but it doesn't give the hope that lasts. Right? And so how do we plug that in our lives? So, so she said, you know, she said what she said just to get through the situation and move on to whatever was next. She doesn't know what's going to happen next. She knows she left her son back there. She knows that she's coming to hunt Elisha down and she's going to drag him back there one way or the other. But she really doesn't know what's going to happen. But there was no peace. There was no shalom for this woman at this time. And so, you know, twice she, says to the, she said to the prophet before this child was born, she said, don't deceive me and don't get my hopes up. And here she is, you know, for having, you know, having the son of her dream die. She couldn't bear the, uh, bear to, to, the, 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 couldn't bear the pain of the, this promise. And this is kind of where she's at. And so anyways, and I'm sure there's times that we can put ourselves right smack in this story. Like, why did this happen to me? I mean, it's been many times I could have injected and have injected that into my life. Like, seriously, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my family? And you have your own story the same way. Why? Don't always know the thing, but, but we're talking about peace again. How do we have peace in the midst of those situations? You know, we, we see this promise of peace all throughout Scripture. And so how do we walk it out in our life? Well, I'm going to give you some of those scriptures here today. Jesus said this in John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. John 14, 27, it says this. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Again, talking about a peace that surpasses all understanding. A peace that's not just, you know, on the surface, but a peace that seeps down into the core of our heart and life through every situation. Psalms 29, verse 11, the psalmist says, the Lord blesses his people with peace. Say, well, what are the promises of God? Well, that's a promise right there. The Lord blesses, you're his people? Guess what? He says he blesses you with his peace. Amen? Jesus said, I give you my peace. Don't be troubled and don't be afraid. Jesus said, I, I, I've spoken unto you that you might have peace. Okay? The Apostle Paul said this, Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. All great promises of, of peace. But how do we put that peace into our heart? How do we make that peace in our life? So, Pastor, okay, that's great, but just reading that scripture, that's, what's that going to do for me? How is that going to help me? I just sit there and read it a gazillion times and hope that somehow or another I have peace? No. There's some steps that we do in what we do. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. We're going to look at that in a second. But it gives us the promise of peace. But what I love about the verse, it also gives us some instruction on how we grasp that peace. 
how that peace becomes a part of our life, how we plug it into our life, how that we can experience God's peace in our life. And, and what happens is if, if we do this verse, you will experience God's peace in your life. And if we don't do it, if we do the opposite, guess what happens? You just don't receive the, that peace that the scriptures talk about. I don't know about you, but I, I, I've been in both those places. I've, I've been in a place where I've had seasons in my life where I've experienced an abundance of God's peace while going through some very traumatic, chaotic situations. And to look back and say, wow, how did I hold it together for that? Because it was more than just my situation, how I was based upon the circumstances around me, but it was a peace that was in me that enabled me to be able to have a peace to carry me through. But the same thing, the, the opposite is true. I've been in seasons where my, my inner life was so chaotic, so out of control mentally, physically, emotionally for me, but everything good was happening all around me. You look around, every, there, was, there was no reason for me to have anxiety. There was no reason for me to be upset. There was no reason for inside to be like, ah, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced it. Some of you are like, but pastor, I think you need to go see a doctor about that. That's what my, do my daughter, who is graduating from to be a physician assistant, that's her famous thing at home. I say, oh, could you tell me, I have this. And she's like, yeah, you should really talk to your doctor about that. I'm like, you are in practices now telling people what to do and you won't give me advice on this? I'm like, what is wrong with this? But that's like everybody who's, who's, uh, you know, a parent is a hairdresser or cuts hair or whatever. They always have no, their hair is always shaggy because they never have time to cut their hair. They say that the shoemaker's, shoe, the shoemaker's kids never have shoes because he's so busy making shoes for everybody else. I'm trying to think what that had to do with this, but anyways. But <laughs> there was a point, but I, I'll remember it next service. So, you know, anyways, whatever the case is, there was a reason. Really good. I'll, I'll, I'll remember it in a couple moments. So, Okay. But anyways, there's those times when I've, my life has been so chaotic and I was at peace, but there's been times when my life was, was good. Everybody's playing nice, right? Everybody in church is playing nice. That's always a good day. Everybody at home is playing nice. That's a really good day. People in your neighborhood are all playing nice. That's a good day, amen? At work, all this, everything's good. But inside, you're ripping apart. There's no peace in you. But God promises peace. Isaiah 26, 3 says it this way. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. It's a simple verse, but it speaks volumes on how that we walk peace out in our life. The, the Living Translation says it this way. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Simple advice, but profound advice. So let's break it down. If we, if we follow the instruction, we'll experience God's peace in life. It, it, it's God's, it's a promise. We just spent six weeks talking about proving, showing how God's continual generation after generation after generation, that he's a faithful God. He's a promise keeper, not a promise breaker. And here we have a promise. How do we put that promise in our life? How do we walk it out? Because it's great to know that God's that, but how do I live it out? How do I walk it? How do I make it mine? So we see other people, oh yeah, oh yeah, praise God, I got the peace of God. Well, I ain't got the peace of God. How do I get that? Well, here's how scripture talks about getting it. First thing is this, is that from what we're reading in this verse, that peace starts, it starts in your mind. He says this, you will keep in perfect peace those whose mind We'll stop right there. It starts with the mind. It, more specifically, it starts with the thoughts that are in our mind. Most people, when stressed, when upset, what do we try to do? We try to find a distraction, right? What, what do we do? We, you know, we, you know, we want to try to find something outside of ourselves, outside of the situation, to try to distract us within that. And so we use all kinds of things. Cake is a great substitute, <laughs> right? You could put in Krispy Kreme donuts in there if you'd like when the hot sign is on. I, ha I have this app. I've got to delete it. It's like, I don't even know why I put it on, but it, it pops up every time Krispy Kreme's hot sign is on. And I don't go run and do it. You know, it's just, I don't know why I kept it on there, but it, there, yeah, there actually is an app for that that tells me that every time, some of you, anybody not had a Krispy Kreme donut here? Let me just say. Anyone just, if, okay, it's okay. We're not going to make fun of you. If you've never had a Krispy Kreme donut, raise your hand. Okay. 
Let me just say, you're never going to make it to heaven if you don't eat a Krispy Kreme donut. More importantly, one that has just been made. Because when they've said for a while, you taste all the lard and they don't taste that good. But when they're fresh out, the, the rack is still moving and they're packing those babies in that little box and you put that thing in your mouth and all that lard just melts and just goes down. And man, and that sugar, oh my, it's like heaven in a little, little dough ball, okay? And it is like the best experience. We did that. We were somewhere at a conference. Totally nothing to do with the message. I'll get back to it in a second. We were somewhere, and one of the guys that was with us had never had a Krispy Kreme donut. And I said, are you kidding me? You've never had a Krispy Kreme donut, you know? And we had no excuse because we do finally have them up here. I, I, I was born in the South. We have them down South, but we don't have them up here. And every time we go visit my grandparents, just about every other night, me and my brother and sister were, that were bored out of our mind because there was nothing to do. We get in the car, drive 30 minutes to Greenville, Spark, uh, Greenville uh, South Carolina with a Krispy Kreme donut, 24 hours pumping out hot donuts all the time. And we get ourselves one or two dozen of hot Krispy Kreme donuts and come back to my grandparents' house and we eat that. And that was what we did in South Carolina when we were visiting family because there was nothing else to do at that age to do. Now there's a lot more. Anyway, so now I appreciate it more than I did then. But, you know, and so we took him and I said, well, you know, I don't know if the hot sign's going to be on. We drive, this is back to that conference. And so this guy, this, one of the guys that's with us, and we, 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 we pull up and I said, the hot sign is on. And they were, the other two guys, well, the hot sign is on. And he's like, what, oh, the hot sign, what's going to do with the hot sign? I'm like, oh, you are blessed from heaven today. We walk in there and he ate that thing and he was just like, oh, my Lord, have mercy. You know, anyways, it changed his life forever. So anyways, let's just... So, yeah, maybe Krispy Kreme donuts is your distraction, okay? Whatever it may be, maybe, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's medication, or maybe it's, you, you have to go shop. But, you know, the problem is, the problem is that when the junk food is gone and when the meds and the alcohol wears off and when the credit card's maxed out and you can't charge anything else, the problem is the stress comes back. And usually comes back with a vengeance. When we lack the peace of mind, we often try to disengage our minds from what is going on in our lives. But what we need to do, instead of disengaging it, we need to engage it, which is usually the opposite response, okay? Engage our thoughts and take charge of what is going on in our minds and our thoughts. Only you can decide what thoughts that you think about. Now, I, there's times I thought, man, I just can't get that out of my head, but the reality is, we are constantly always pushing thoughts out of our head. We're choosing constantly what to listen to you. There's some here, you're, you're engaged in what I'm saying because it's connecting. And there's a couple of you possibly, maybe not, maybe next service, but you're just thinking about what do I need to order off of Amazon? And I'm just going to do it right now because I'm going to forget. Or you're, 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 maybe you're smiling, looking good, but, but your mind, I, listen, I, why am I saying that? Because I've been in services before where that I'm smiling, looking like I'm engaged, but my brain is way somewhere else. So I'm not calling anybody out here today. I'm just simply saying I've been exactly where you are right now because we choose what we're going to think about and what we're not going to think about. We allow things in and we disallow things in, okay? We do it all the day, 24 hours a day. Not 24 when you're sleeping, you're not, but we do it all the time. We choose what we're focusing on. There's things that, that attract us and we'll, we'll give we'll give. We'll give way to thoughts that we shouldn't give way to. And, there's, and the reality is, thoughts will pop in, but we have to choose. No, no, I'm going to push that out. i got to stay focused. What do we say? i got to focus on this. Okay? So, so you can't tell me that, that we don't decide what thoughts we think, because we do. We choose what we're going to focus on. And it's, it's a discipline. We have to learn to do that and make it a point to do that. And so we have to be intentional in our thought life or our thoughts will take on a life of their own. If I'm not intentional, then it's just controlling me. You're just bouncing over here, bouncing over there. Well, let's do this, let's do that. And you're just, you'll find yourself all over the place because you're, not, you're being controlled by the direction of what you, every, every thought that just pops in our head. And the more we train ourselves to do that, we're all over the place instead of saying, no, 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 I'm going to focus on this. And listen, I am, my, my, my kids would laugh, when, they're going to laugh when they hear this because I definitely have that squirrel, you know, like, oh, wow, whoa, what's, you know, I definitely have that. I'm not even going to look in that direction because my family knows that too. And, but, but I have to constantly bring my, that, I have that attention issue and I have to bring it back and say, no, this is what I'm focusing on now. Is it easy? No, it's not always easy. Sometimes it is very easy, and sometimes it's extremely difficult. But you know what? 
I make the decision what I will focus on and what I will push out of thinking. And I have to take control of it. Okay? And it, it comes by practice and doing that. Anyways, so, so, so we wage a war daily when we choose which thoughts that we think. It's a daily war. What, what do I, am I choosing to think of? You know, personally, you know, I said, I've, I've battled those things and I, where I've had to say, I will not allow those thoughts in my mind. I will not allow this distraction. This is what I'm doing. I'm not going to be distracted by that. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5 says this. It's the New Life version. It says, we, we break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself up against the wisdom of God. We take hold of every thought and make it obey Christ. That's pretty directive and pretty forceful when you think about that. Let me read it again. We break down every thought and proud thing that puts itself up against the wisdom of God. So what the, the enemy was always putting things against it. You know, sometimes it's spiritual things like, hey, you know, this Jesus thing is nothing. And, or, you know, God really doesn't love you. Or you're this or you're that. Constantly bringing things. And he'll use other people to do the same exact thing. And what Paul is saying is that we've got to take hold of every thought, make it obedient to Christ. In other words, what does Jesus say about this? You know, I'm not going to allow this thing to rule my life and reign, reign my life, but I, I'm bringing it to the obedience of Christ, the obedience of God's word. It's taking your thought captive. It, it simply can mean it this way, gaining control over what you think about yourself, your life, and God. I'm bringing it into obedience to Christ. When you put in your, uh, what you put your mind in, put your mind on has an effect on what you think when, when I put my mind focused on when I allow to put into my mind and what I think that's why it's so important that you got to be careful you know about, Bible talks about you guarding your heart you know we just open ourselves up to so much stuff and there's a lot of those things that that are constantly trying to 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 get you to say well you know Jesus isn't the only way there's this, there's that. But we know that it's, it's Christ. We, we know the word. Anyways, so we, what do we put into our mind has an effect on what we think. Think about, as a kid, those little scary, I, mean, I remember I watched as a, as a kid, a long time ago, the, the, the creature from the Black Lagoon. When I look at it now, it is the cheesiest. Like some guy in this like rubber costume walking around with like fins and flippers and things on, you know, scaring people. I mean, I look at that and like, why was I afraid of that? I was so afraid. One time I saw, I remember, I saw a, a, a vampire movie. My parents would have like flipped out if they knew it. This was like when I was young. I don't even know how I saw it. But it was one of the old, you know, the black and white ones, the old, old ones, which are like so corny if you even see anyone now like that. It's like, really? It was so scary. I remember I was petrified that I literally dug through in my room. I don't know how old I was. This was when we lived in Pennsylvania. So I was like in... I don't know, third grade or something like that, in fourth grade. I dug through everything in my room. I found this little glow-in-the-dark cross. I have, um, we're, we're not Catholics. I, it wasn't like we had crosses all over the place, you know? Like, I, mean, I it had the cross, but I understand what I'm saying. It's like, you know, I mean, Catholic friends of mine, they have lots of crosses. You know, as a Protestant, I didn't, I, we had a cross, but I wasn't putting, we didn't have them up all over the place. And, and I dug until I found this little cross, and I stuck that thing on my wall. I think I taped it on there. It's like, any vampire comes in here, I got my glow-in-the-dark cross up there. <laughs> You know, it's like, you're like, what in the world is that going to do? But I let that in, in that nightmare of that. I was scared of that. But, but then after a while, you learn that if you, if, if you have nightmares after watching a scary movie, don't watch a scary movie. It's not like, duh, you know. I don't know, some of you love to get scared. I, I get that. But, but you don't love the nightmare movie that takes place after, the dream afterwards. And so, but it's, it's, we've got to learn to, what are we putting into our mind? God has provided a way for us to overcome unhealthy thoughts and behaviors and to gain self-control uh, and gain the self-control that we seek. He gives us the opportunity to do that. And it's a matter of taking charge of your life his way. And that's where it says we take hold of every thought and make it obey Christ, or obedient to Christ. What does God's word say about this? What did Jesus say about this? You know, if this is something that, you know, that, that not, shouldn't be a part of my life, and no, I, I'm not going to allow that into my life. I'm not going to entertain that thought. I'm not going to allow that to be, well, I don't, I don't know where it came from. Well, I mean, sometimes it just comes from like stupid stuff or commercials or things, but sometimes the enemy is using thoughts that he's putting in your mind. The Bible calls them those flaming darts, those arrows that come into our life that we have to extinguish them because if you don't extinguish them, it burns up your life. 
Anything that's on fire, it's going gonna, it's gonna to ignite whatever it hits. And the enemy will use every opportunity to do that in your life. And so, you know, so what did Jesus say about it? John 14, 27. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not be afraid. So that's what I think about when I don't have peace. God, I thank you. Jesus said he gives me his peace. I'm not maybe feeling peace right now, but I'm declaring that peace is in my life. I'm going to walk in peace today. This situation is not going to rob me of my peace. But Father, I thank you that your peace is flooding my heart. Your peace is flooding my mind today. That your supernatural peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, flows into my life. He says, do not let, do not let, or we say it this way, do not allow your hearts to be troubled and do not be afraid. What, do not, why do you say do not allow? He says, because I've given you this peace. So take a stand against the things that try to rob your peace. God, I thank you that you give me peace today. There's a lot of thing that, things that try to rob our peace in our life. We have to take a stand. So, that's what, that's, so that is what I think about. That's what I declare. That's what I meditate on. That's what I proclaim over my life. Because peace starts my mind with your thoughts. It's something that you and I can do something about. Second thing is this, I gotta move along. I know Jimmy took all my time today, so I gotta get going. <laughs> Problem is I'm on a timer and I can see that I'm actually way over, but we're gonna move on. Peace requires a disciplined thought life. It really does, because there's, as I said, there's something always trying to attack our life. Isaiah 26, verse three says it this way. We, we said this, you will keep in perfect peace whose mind is, who mind, who's, those whose, let me try that again. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are stayed. Some translations say steadfast. Other translations say fixed, but they all mean the same thing. In other words, whose minds remain in a... The definition of stay means to remain in a specified state or place. Our minds stay in the place it should be. Fixed, steadfast, stayed. And you know, interesting, another word, another thing I, I didn't even think about, that, that a stay, the word stays on a, on a ship, if anyone's ever worked on a boat, that you know the masks, the, the, the thing that holds the sail, that is important for the, the ship to move forward and, and to, to hold the sails and do all the things that it does, the, the rigging. The, the, the stays are the standing riggings of ropes and wires and rods that hold a ship's mast upright, even in the worst of storms. The stays are the things that keeps the ship and the mast that is so vitally important for the... Listen, if you don't have an engine and you lose your mast, you're just floating around. You have no control. So the mast, especially back in ancient times where they didn't have machines and engines and things like that, the mast is your lifeblood. And so the stays are the things that keep it together because you have to have that mast. If you don't have it, then, you're, then you, you're gonna, you could possibly die. Most likely you're going to die on the sea of starvation, of lack of water, all kind of things like that. And so the stays are the things that hold, our, hold things together. When we think about it for our life, the right kind of thoughts have the power to prepare us, embrace us for whatever storms may come our way. They are stays, security, that keeps us with peace that enables us to move forward in the situation. Peace becomes that stability. Our thoughts, when we, how we allow God to work, like, gives us stability for that. So let me, but let me, I want to be very clear about this. I'm not talking about, and I'm not saying about think positive thoughts. I'm not saying and talking about positive energy. I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm not talking about mind over matter. I'm not talking about the universe telling you anything or speaking anything into your life because it's not about some new age substitute. It is about the living word of God, his promises that we cling to instead of the enemy's bombardment of lies against us. We need to be very clear. There's some lingo that just flows around so much. I know I see it sometimes in social media in Christians. Listen, the universe, if you're not talking to God, I don't know what you're talking to, so you're talking to some other universe. You need to know, and what, if, so I'm just talking, well, then why don't you just say who you're talking to? Why don't you, why, why do we got to make it some ooh, spooky thing, or whatever? I'm sending, listen, and listen, I know this probably may offend somebody, and I, I, I don't apologize, but I'm, this, is, this is my opinion, and I think I'm still a loud opinion, I think, you know, sometimes we're not a lot of opinions anymore, but, you know, 
but the fact is, like, some of the lingo that we use, we, we be, as, as the church, as the body of Christ, we need to be very careful of what we do because there's a lot of, of, of substitutes that come in and seep in and try to take away and water down and vanilla out everything in the Word of God to just positive vibes and energy and the universe is speaking to me or I throw it out to the universe. and It's just going to keep floating if you throw it out in the universe, okay? It, just, it becomes space junk, Okay? I want to know that I'm not just talking to a bunch of air out there. I want to be talking to my Heavenly Father. I want to be standing on His Word, not some positive vibe, positive energy. I want God's Word in my life. Amen? I think as Christians, we need to be very clear with what we say and what we're talking about and what defines who we are. There's a lot of things that come in. And listen, this is not just now. It's always been there. It always has been through centuries and decades to try to water down God's word. And we need to be clear. No, this is what God's word says. And this is who I'm talking about. And this is what I'm standing on. I'm not talking and, and hanging on all this other stuff that sounds good, but it's so not God's word. Okay? It's not in the Bible. And so I don't apologize for the word of God. And I, I don't apologize on the fact that we have to be careful that we're not substituting God for some floaty thing out there, okay? That's not my Heavenly Father. And Jesus, that's not my Savior, amen? That's doing that. I need to talk about who Jesus is and talk about what God's doing. So we're told to take hold of every thought. I know some of you are like, okay, Pastor, move on. I am, we're moving on. We're almost done too. We're told to take hold of every thought and make it obey God. In other words, you decide, I decide that thoughts, I decide which thoughts are off limits, Things I need to, there are things that I need to refuse to think about. There are things that I need to list that, that I direct in my life, in every area of my life, that this is. See, when Leslie and I got, we talked about this before, but there's words that we said for ourselves in our relationship that we said, we will not, when we're in an argument, when I'm mad at you and you're mad at me, we will not use the word divorce. We won't say it. We may think it, but we're not going to say it. We're not going to give the power to it to speak that into your ear because once you hear it, you can't unhear it. There's a lot of things you say, and that's the problem. We're in issues because we, oh, I've got so much I'd love to say right now, and I just don't have any time. Oh, wow, we need to really go. I didn't realize what time it was. So, anyways, but it's a lot of stuff that happens. We, 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 we throw things out there, and the problem is we forget it just stays. It's, it's like the internet. You post something, you think it's long, gone because you deleted it. It's not gone, it's there forever. I don't know about forever, but it's there for a long time. So we have to decide. We, we need to, what I will not, you know, that I will not think about what that person said anymore. I've, I've been that. I've had to live that out where I had someone that did something really bad to me and my wife, and I had to make a decision to stop thinking about what they did. Was it hard? Yeah, it was hard because I was really ticked off about it. I was mad. You ever been mad before? Pastors get mad too. I was really mad, and I was hurt, and I was, I was angry. I mean, that thing was eating me alive. Thank God I moved past it, and God helped me do through it, and I, anytime I run into that individual now, I'm totally fine. But you know what? I had to make a decision not to think about what they did, because the more I thought about what they did, the more I get angrier at them. And well, the problem is what happened, we, we kind of are, we get mad about it, but we add, some, we add pieces to the story. Stuff that didn't even happen. Or I bet they really meant this. I bet they really thought this. I, if they didn't, I'm sure they would have done this if I let that happen. Right, All, we just embellished the whole thing. I got to decide I will not remember this event. I will not allow myself to think about this situation as hopeless. I will not dwell on this mistake. We all have certain patterns of thought in, that hinder our ability to stay focused on God's purpose for our life. We need to take authority over it. And the last thing is this. Peace requires my mind to be focused on God alone. Jesus said, you will keep in perfect, or Isaiah said, you will keep in perfect peace those whose mind is stayed on you. What, do we, what, do we, what is the mind stayed on? In the, the Eastern practice of meditation, it, it teaches about emptying your mind of everything, but that's not what we're trying to do. We're, what we're doing is we're not going to empty our mind. We just want to remove the junk out of it. I don't know, when I, clean my, when I clean my bedroom, I don't throw everything out the window. I need the bed. I need the, I need the dresser. I need the clothes. But you know what? The junk, I'm going to get the junk out. I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to keep the things I need. And in our mind, there's some stuff that we need, but there's definitely some, some junk that we need to get rid of. 
that we need to be more Christ-like, line up to Christ, reflect Christ, and begin to bring that in our life because everything that is not of God goes. The one, that, the one whose mind is stayed on God will experience perfect peace, the scriptures talk about. But that's not where our mind stays so many times. So many times it stays in the past. It stays on the problem. It stays on the fears. It stays on what the person said. It stays on, on my failures. It stays on everything but God's presence in our life. Yet when all that rules our thinking, peace cannot rule. When all those things are ruling, peace has no place within our life. And that's why Joshua said, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, my third ending, so this, we're, already, we're there. You guys know, three endings. All pastors have three endings, mostly. This is, this is it. This is why Joshua said, Joshua 1, 8, this book of the law shall not depart from my mouth, but you, shall medita- but you shall meditate it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Getting God's word in my life, it keeps me on track. The psalmist said it this way, Psalms 119, verse 15, and then 97. He says, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. And then the other verse, he says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. He knew, I've got, to, I've got to get that in my mind. And that's not walking around like a zombie quoting scripture all day. It's just living out the scripture in all that you do throughout the day. Don't be one of those flaky Christians that everything, well, bless God, every, every time they say something, it has to come out in God's word. Well, that doesn't look like Jesus or whatever. I don't know. They get very judgmental and all kinds of things like that. Because this is just living it out, walking it out in your everyday normal life. Amen. Walking at God's promise. And so to experience God's peace in your life, I've got to fix my mind on God's presence. I need to get his word inside me and his mercy, understand his mercy, understand God's love, understand his power, and know that God's promises are definitely for me. That God means it when he promises peace, when he promises shalom within your life. It's yours to experience when you put yourself in a position to receive it. Father God, I thank you for today. Lord, all that we talked about, Somehow, you make sense of it in the lives of the people that need it right now. Holy Spirit, just direct exactly the points and the pieces that's going to speak into people's hearts right now, Father God, that's going to help them make this week completely different than weeks previous. That they're going to walk in a peace because they're going to bring those things in control that the enemy tries to use to distract their peace, to rob their peace. And Father God, I just thank you as we fix our mind on you, as we follow what God's word says, we follow what your word says, God, in Isaiah, and let that be a part of our life, that we can begin to put simple, basic points into place in our life, that we can walk out the promise that you give us of a God peace that brings a strength, that brings a hope, and brings a shalom into every part of our being. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, if you need prayer, our team would love to pray with you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. I have one more promise to give you.